<clears throat> Our next presenter, Lawrence Mate, is a local meat maker. On his blog, thislittlepiggy.us, he dishes up meaty morsels and musings. And right about now, he's going to come up here and give us a little bit more of that tongue. Uh, and if that doesn't excite you, here's the man of flesh in the flesh, Lawrence Mate. I thought it would be a nice warm-up act if people got um, a little bit of my tongue in their mouth before uh, we start the show and you get um, all these tongues in your eyes and in your ears. Let's hit it. Yeah. What? That's the last image. <laughs> Uh-oh. We're going to get to that one. That one's a good one. But you got to wait. You can't do gold first. There we go. So anyway, my apologies for sticking my tongue out at everyone, um, my tongue and 19 other tongues, um, making a monster of myself in this way. But I want to just ask um, what it is about sticking our tongues out that is so um, provocative. Um, so using my tongue to speak about the tongue, um, speaking in tongues, as it were, I'm hoping that you can start to imagine um, the tongue layered upon tongue or the tongue folded back upon itself, maybe even refolded or enfolded in the embrace of the tongue until it becomes a maze, um, a maze that we find ourselves lost in. Because after all, language is literally rooted in the tongue. So how can the tongue talk about itself without tying itself in knots? How can the tongue turn upon itself, touch upon its own roots without disarticulating itself? And in the end, all I'm trying to do here tonight is to articulate the tortured silence of such a self-disarticulating tongue. Now, the origin of this experience for me is the word abligarition, which is an old word, and it simply means prodigal expenditure for food. But in its roots, this word also points to a certain aberration of the tongue, being excessively fond of food, being licorice or licorice. And um, this fear of the tongue, I think, is tied to a fear of sensuality and sexuality, um, particularly female sexuality, as if the tongue at its dark, imaginary roots is connected to the penis and shouldn't be wielded by a woman as a weapon, <laughs> as you'll see in the next image, where um, if the tongue is a mock penis, it also mocks the penis, because making a mockery of our face when we disfigure it in that way um, we also mock those gazing on us who see themselves in this distorted mirror of our face. Because we're all familiar with sticking our tongue out at someone as an act of self-assertion or defiance of those who would mock us or those who would look down upon us. Um, here you see the tongue drawn from its sheath like a dagger challenging us to a fight, but it's a mock dagger, you know, a poor substitute in the hands or the mouth of a woman or a child. It's a mock threat, but also a very real one because it mocks the very thing which, above all, shouldn't be mocked. And I think all this is nicely encapsulated in this ad where the tongue is stuck out as an act of defiance. It becomes um, an act of freedom or independence, but um, also it's not a coincidence that it's the tongue of a woman or that the ACLU has made its name um, defending reproductive rights because throughout history, a loose tongue has been associated with a loose woman. So hopefully, anyway, by now, you can see um, in this image this kind of enigma or black hole behind or underneath the tongue from which it emerges. Is it a womb or nest from which the tongue emerges, or is it a yawning tomb in which um, the tongue is devoured? And I don't think I have to explain what wood, you know, um, is a slang term for. Anyway, this is an image of um, what I call the demonic tongue, um, the dangerous tongue. Um, if the tongue is American as American pie, it can also be dangerous, threatening, and we have to close the gates on it. And the teeth are the first line of defense against this demonic tongue. I collaborated with Paul Young to get this other alien reference in here. It's a great movie. Everyone should see it. And there you have, you know, these teeth that are a threat, but then the tongue that shoots out like a penis, and it's got the second set of teeth on the end of it. So it's this kind of redoubled threat. And now I just want to quickly look at a few slides of um, images of control, so that if the tongue is like a sword, like a weapon, you know, then it's like, well, do we need to take um, a second sword and turn it against the tongue? 
um, to transfix it or pierce it and immobilize it. I mean, you talk about biting your tongue. That is, that's something else. And then in this sculpture um, by an artist named Lee Bonacou, um, she's composed this mouth-like orifice entirely of um, saw blades. And I think it's so unsettling because of the uncertainty of whether all these teeth are there to protect us from a threat behind the mouth or whether the teeth are themselves a threat. And so here you see the teeth um, again then put behind another cage, which is like a set of teeth. Um, so it's like the mouth is enclosed inside another orifice. Um, and in this last image you see the same kind of doubling where there are teeth um, that appear dangerous as if they're about to bite and they have to be, it's like they need to be hidden from view behind the lips. When we talk about, you see this is a kind of literalization of the metaphor, we need to zip your lips, but the very teeth of the zipper re-embody the thread of the teeth that they're supposed to be hiding. And this is not just um, some Photoshop fantasy that a few people cooked up and that I stumbled across. This is something with a whole um, history and um, legacy. These are all called um, scolds, um, branks, um, or gags, um, they were used for hundreds of years, um, strapped to the head of women who thought or were judged to have misused their tongues or abused their freedom of speech. It has a metal tongue that's inserted into the mouth to immobilize the woman's tongue. On it are these metal barbs that actually lacerate the tongue and bite into it. So it's like um, a punishment um, to bite the tongue of someone who's incapable of restraining their own tongue. Um, it's a mask that like makes a mockery of someone who has made a mockery of their own face until, as you can see in this image, um, the woman is restrained on a leash, um, being led along docilely by the man who's got his wooden staff of authority, again, in control. But all these images are um, images of a violence that's imposed from outside, of a torture that's inflicted. And I want to ask in the last two, what happens when such a silence is internalized, self-imposed, um, and yet manages to make itself heard, or at least visible. Um, and I think in the light of all the other images we've seen, one like this becomes haunting, maybe even mutely eloquent. And finally, I just want to ask um, if it's possible to imagine such a self-imposed silence as golden. And that's where um, that image of the golden tongue should be, yes, <laughs> should be coming in. Um, and this is an image from a performance work in which the artist literally wraps her tongue with gold leaf, um, which of course has the effect of immobilizing him, paralyzing it, rendering the tongue um, impotent and leaving it um, dribbling pathetically and idiotically. Um, and I just wanted to ask finally, is this an eloquent image of the silence that haunts even the most golden-tongued oratory? Thanks. Thanks.